The first Europeans who settled along the rivers of Eastern Australia about 200 years ago noticed many beaver-like animals in the open pools of water. People had never seen anything like them before. Were they mammals, birds or reptiles? The first skins sent to London aroused great suspicion and were regarded as fakes by many scientists of the day. But after many years of doubt and argument, the question was finally settled in 1884. The platypus and two other animals were placed in a special group of mammals because they all laid eggs. Scientists today classify the world of mammals into three main orders or groups based on the method of reproduction. The largest and most successful group includes nearly all living mammals. They're called placentals because they nurture the fetus in the womb by means of a placenta. In this group, we find animals like cats, dogs, seals, giraffes, elephants, beavers and humans. All these animals have hair on their bodies, are warm-blooded and feed their young on milk. A smaller group of mammals are the marsupials. Here we find kangaroos, koalas, wombats and possums. They also have hair on their bodies, are warm-blooded and feed their young on milk but the young of marsupials are born at a very early stage of development before climbing into a pouch on the female's body. The third group of mammals is a very small one, just three species. These are the monotremes, the egg-laying mammals. Here we find the platypus and two species of echidna, also called spiny anteaters. They are very different from all other mammals because they lay eggs. But they still have hair on their bodies, still feed their young on milk, and they're also warm-blooded. Although monotremes lay eggs like reptiles, they shouldn't be thought of as representing an early stage in mammal evolution. For we now know that the three groups of mammals all develop separately from the same ancestors starting about 200 million years ago. All three groups evolved quite independently, although they do have many things in common. We still don't know a lot about the very early mammals, and there are several theories on how each of the three groups developed, particularly the monotremes. First, let's look at the echidna family. This is the short-beaked echidna, or spiny anteater. It's fairly common and found all over the Australian mainland. It has hair over most of its body, as well as many long, sharp spines. The spines are not poisonous, but they are very sharp. There are no spines on the underside, and the hair is a lot thinner. The word monotreme means one whole and refers to the single opening used for both reproduction and excretion of body wastes. While this is an accurate description of these egg-laying mammals, it's not exclusive. For marsupials also have only one opening. The short powerful legs and pointed snout are specially adapted for digging into the nests of ants their main source of food. Here's a slow motion film of an echidna picking up white ants from a dish. See how the ants stick to the tongue. Echidnas seem to swim quite well. This could be useful in a climate where there are sometimes floods.
There's no doubt that echidnas look a little bit like hedgehogs and porcupines, but they're not closely related to either of those animals in any way. Hedgehogs and porcupines are both placental mammals. Although they are warm-blooded, echidnas, like all the egg-laying mammals, have a body temperature that is a little bit lower than the placental mammals and marsupials. These differences, however, don't seem to affect their ability to survive and reproduce. This is all the more amazing because each female echidna produces only one egg each year and the survival rate must be very high for echidnas to be so widespread and so successful. Mating takes place in July and August. About two weeks later, the female lays one egg. This is placed into a simple pouch on the underside of its body. Nobody yet knows how. The egg is soft-shelled, about the size of a thumbnail. And after about ten days, the young echidna, inside the egg, uses a sharp tooth to cut through the rubbery shell. You can see how very small the young echidna is at this stage. Inside the pouch, the young finds one of the milk patches to feed itself. There's a mammary gland on each side of the pouch, but no nipples. The milk comes through several pores in the skin. You can see the milk inside this baby echidna. The female echidna carries the young around with her for the next two months as she forages for ants and termites. The young echidna here is about one month old and hangs on firmly to the underside of the female. It still feeds on milk supplied by its mother. Later on, the female leaves the young in a den or burrow, for by now the young has started to grow short spines and will be too large and prickly to carry about. This young echidna is about two and a half months old. At four months, its spines are beginning to show quite clearly. Notice the powerful feet and claws. Not until it's nearly one year old will the young leave its mother to lead a life of its own. The short-beaked echidna has a very wide distribution in Australia. You can find them in the tall forests of the coastal areas, as well as in the deserts of the inland. They also occur in some parts of Papua New Guinea. The other echidna in the group of egg-laying mammals is the long-beaked echidna. This animal is found only in the humid mountain forests of Papua New Guinea and West Irian. The long-beaked echidna lives mainly on earthworms which it finds by searching through the forest litter. In fact, very little is known about this rare egg-laying mammal. It's much larger than its Australian relative, with more fur on its body, and only a few short spines. There are fossil remains of similar large echidnas in Australia, and also fossil remains of a giant long-beaked echidna that became extinct about 20,000 years ago. The giant echidna was about three times the size of this present-day animal. Now, the platypus. The platypus is probably the best known of all the egg-laying mammals, amazingly specialized for life in the water. It's not a very large animal, about half the size of a domestic cat. 
it has a covering of very dense waterproof fur which traps a layer of air next to the skin. Both front and back feet are webbed, although it uses only the front legs as paddles. Each rear ankle of the male platypus carries a small venomous spur, probably used in territorial disputes with other male platypuses. In captivity, they've been known to kill each other with poison from these spurs. Here the tail is being held up to show the spur on each hind leg. At one time, these animals were hunted for their fur, but now they're totally protected. The muzzle, or bill of the platypus, looks a bit like that of a duck, but unlike a duck's bill, it is soft and rubbery. The nostrils are near the tip. They have no teeth, only hard grinding pads for chewing up their food. On land, the platypus curls up the front webbed feet to walk on its knuckles. This slow motion film shows how the short legs that come out of the side of its body give the platypus a kind of rolling action when it moves on land. But its real home is in the water. The platypus usually lives and breeds in rivers where there are open pools of deep water. Platypuses can be found in most of the creeks and rivers that flow from the Great Dividing Range in eastern Australia. High rainfall and melting snow in spring send torrents of water into many river systems. In most of these places, the platypus is fairly common, but sometimes difficult to see in the dark, swirling water. Underwater, they search among the stones and rocks for freshwater shrimps, insect larvae, and fish eggs. The soft rubbery muzzle is crammed with very sensitive nerve endings. When it's underwater, the platypus usually closes its eyes and relies mostly on the sense of touch in its muzzle. As platypuses often feed in water that's not very clear, or at night when it's dark, it's easy to understand why they don't rely on vision to find their way about, or when they hunt for food. They return to the surface after each dive to breathe air. They can stay underwater for as long as three minutes, but usually each dive lasts only about one minute. The white patches that you can see are actually areas of light-colored fur below the groove which contains the eyes and ears. This groove closes when the platypus dives. The platypus uses only its front legs for swimming. The back legs act as rudders and the tail is used as a kind of balance. The front legs are more fully webbed than the back legs. When they're searching for food, they swing their heads from side to side. It's been suggested that they can sense the movement of water reflected from objects around them. They don't usually need to touch an object to know that it's there. When it's not in the water feeding, the platypus spends its time in a short burrow dug in the riverbank. In spring, 
Male and female platypuses come together for breeding. Mating probably takes place in the water, but it's never been observed. At this time, the female digs a nesting burrow into the riverbank, usually about 10 meters or 30 feet long. The entrance to the nesting burrow is always above water level and usually well hidden among grass, tree roots or stones. There are many twists and turns in this burrow and sometimes more than one entrance. The female platypus will also block off the passageway at a number of places while she's inside. Here, on a platform of leaves and grass, the female will incubate the two creamy coloured eggs. Each egg is about the size of a thumbnail. The female holds the eggs close to her body, the tail curled around her head. We don't yet know how long it takes for the very small eggs to hatch, but it's probably about ten days. When they hatch, each young platypus is less than a centimetre long, but starts to grow very quickly. At three days old, it is almost double in size and starts to suck milk from its mother. The female can now leave the young in the nest burrow for short periods in the morning and evening while she looks for food in the river nearby. There may be several well-hidden nesting burrows along any stretch of river with open pools of water. The female has to block and unblock the burrow every time she leaves it or returns. So that they can cope with the depleted air in their burrow system, platypuses have evolved rather special blood with a very large number of oxygen-carrying cells. This type of blood may also be useful for extended underwater dives. The milk glands on the female platypus lie along each side of the body. There are no nipples. The milk comes out from large pores on the skin surface. Now the young platypus is seven days old. It's nearly four centimetres long, or about one and a half inches, and growing quickly. At six weeks, it's about 12 centimetres long, nearly five inches, but still blind and without fur. It's now about two months old and the fur has started to grow. Its eyes won't open for about another week or two, but even at this age it's not very large. The young platypus first leaves the burrow when it's about three and a half months old. At this stage it's not as large as its parents but soon begins to catch food on the river bottom. Most of the time, platypuses eat insect larvae and worms, but sometimes they manage to catch small freshwater shrimps. There's no doubt that the platypus is really a very successful egg-laying mammal. It has developed special skills to survive in a particular environment. And so have the echidnas we looked at earlier. These egg-laying mammals have survived because each has been able to exploit the environment in which it lives. And we shouldn't think about them as relics of the past, but rather as mammals which have evolved along different lines very successfully. Scientists now regard the egg-laying mammals as equally well adapted as other mammals to life 
in their own particular environment.